earlier we didn't have any idea about uh, gravity okay so as far as we know it was ptolemy who had put this idea forward of the geocentric geocentric universe where earth is at the center and everything else revolves around the earth okay then there were some modifications right so i don't know whether this idea was there in india or not but aryabhatta as far as we know he was the first person to talk about the heliocentric nature of the universe okay so according to aryabhatta aryabhatta wrote in one of his treatises that the universe is actually heliocentric okay so these were very early records of the gravity so this was 2000 years back around the time of jesus and this was in the 5th century okay after that so in greece they were believing they were believing in this idea only of the geocentric universe okay and uh, because this idea was picked up by the churches okay so whatever religion believes people also believe right so this idea was picked up by the churches ge uh, geocentric idea and therefore people believed blindly in that idea okay without questioning then came the copernicus in 15th century and he told openly against the churches okay so he had that courage so he said that geocentric model is not correct it is the heliocentric model so what is heliocentric model that sun is at the center and everything else i mean the planets revolve around the sun okay so he had to face lot of opposition for that okay and then again in the 16th century galileo he believed in copernicus ideas and again he showed the courage uh, to say it to the world that the world is actually heliocentric heliocentric meaning sun is at the center of the universe and everything else revolves around the sun that means planets they revolve around the sun it's not the earth which is at center it's the sun which is at center okay so people had idea of gravity because whatever we throw up in air it comes back right it must be because of some attractive force due to the earth okay so people had some idea of, about gravity but didn't know they didn't know uh, what is the nature of that force okay or the formula for that force so the big work in that direction was done by tycho brahe so he observed trajectories of planets and stars his entire life okay so can you imagine somebody doing that so he observed the trajectories of stars and planets he not only observed he recorded it okay he had written it down okay so he had years and years of data so this day this planet was at this position next day it went to this position and he had done it using his eyes only okay no telescope nothing so he had formulated a lot of data years of data and his data was studied by his assistant johans kepler and he gave us three laws about the planetary motion okay so those laws are there in our book okay we are going to study about them so he gave us three laws of planetary motion tycho tycho brahe had recorded recorded meaning not he he had not filmed okay he had uh, looked at the sky looked at the positions of the planets and stars and he had recorded their trajectories okay written down about the positions of the planets and stars okay record that uh, he recorded the trajectory so after that came great scientist of course sir isaac newton so <clears throat> he deeply studied <clears throat> i'm sorry he deeply studied these three laws 
and Tycho Brahe's data and some other data. Okay, and he gave us the universal law of gravitation. Universal law of gravity. Okay, so this is short history of gravitation. Right. So now uh, you might say, what is then this history? Okay, but see, this is people's life's work, right? And um, Copernicus, Galileo, they had done lot of sacrifice. Okay, they had done lot of sacrifice for the sake of this theory. Okay, which is named after Newton only. So people remember only Newton and not all these people. So that's why it is important to tell. All right. So let's talk about the Kepler's laws. Okay, let's talk about the Kepler's laws. Of planetary motion. So Kepler gave us three laws of planetary motion. So first law is known as law of orbits. What is the law of orbits? Every planet revolves around the Earth. Sorry, every planet revolves around the Sun in an elliptical orbit. Okay, so this is law of orbits. Every planet revolves around the sun in an elliptical orbit. Having sun at one of the foci of the ellipse, one of the foci. Ellipse. Okay, so do you know about an ellipse? Yes, no. Have you studied ellipse in mathematics? Okay, so, anyways, ellipse looks like this. Okay, this is ellipse, and there are two foci of ellipse. Okay, so what does the focus mean? So, this is one point, this is another point which is called as focus. Okay, so now let's suppose you take any point on the circumference of this ellipse. Okay, so let's suppose I take this point. Okay, let's suppose I take this point. Let's call it A. So this is first focus F1, this is second focus F2. The line passing through those two foci is known as the major axis. Okay, so this is known as major axis. Okay, its length is from this point to this point, right? And then what is an ellipse? So, ellipse is such a curve for which all points, okay, distance of all points from this focus F1 and F2. So, if you take this distance F1A and this distance F2A, so some of those two distances will be equal, okay. So, for an example, if you take this point A, so this distance F1A plus F2A, F1A, sorry, plus F2A will be equal to, you take any other point, okay, anywhere. So, you take this point, let's say, this is B. So, this distance is F1B and this is F2B. So, this distance will be equal to what? Some of these distances, F1A and F2A is equal to F2, sorry, F2B plus F1B. Okay. You take another point, let's suppose this point is C. So, distance of this point from F1 and F2 is F1C and, sorry, 
F2 is here. Okay. So F1C plus F2C will be equal to F1A plus F2A. It will be equal to F1B plus F2B. Got it? Yes, no? All right. So let's suppose the sun is at F1 or F2 at one of the foci, two foci of the ellipse. Then every planet it revolves in this kind of elliptical orbit. So let's suppose this is Earth. Okay. So the orbit of Earth around Sun is elliptical. This is the first law. Okay. So now this much distance, this much distance is known as the major axis. And then if you take distance equal to half of this major axis, half of the major axis. So this much distance. Okay. So if you take midpoint of the major axis, let's suppose this is the midpoint. So distance AO or distance OB, it is semi major axis. Okay, distance AO is equal to distance OB and it is known as semi major axis. Okay, and if planet revolves in this elliptical orbit around Sun, then its average distance from Sun is equal to the semi major axis. Okay, its average distance in this orbit. It is equal to what? The semi major axis. It is equal to half of the major axis. Right. So, this is first law which is known as law of orbits. So, let's see next law. Second law, K plus second law is known as law of areas. Okay. So, what is law of areas? So, again, let's consider an ellipse. Let's draw an ellipse. So, let's suppose this is sun and this is any planet. Okay, for an example, it's earth. So, now if you join, if you join uh, sun and earth, okay, so let's call it radius of the planet. Okay, or let's call this position vector. So, position vector of this planet, it sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. Okay. So, this law is the line joining position of sun to position of planet. Position of planet sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time equal intervals of intervals of <coughs> time okay so let's see what does this mean so line joining the position of sun to the position of planet it is this line when the planet is here if planet is here it will be this line. So, it moves through equal areas in equal intervals of time. So, let's suppose in some time, let's call it time t, the planet moves from this position to this position. Okay. So, its position vector or line joining sun and the planet, it will be this one now. Okay. So, it has moved through this much area. It has moved through this much area right so let's suppose planet mode okay from here to here from let's call it a to b in some time t okay now let's suppose when planet is here at some other position let's say here okay let's call it point c and it moves from c to some other point d in equal time Okay, in equal time. Okay, so then 
its position vector or the line joining sun to the planet it will move from here to here right so again it moves through this much area it moves through this much area okay so the kepler's law of area says that if this uh sorry if the planet moves from a to b and from c to d in equal time then this area and this area will be equal okay then this area and this area will be equal that means it sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time so is this law clear so now this is second law and now let's see why is it so okay why does the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time so now here is sun okay and here is some planet right now suppose it is at this position right so we can draw its position vector this is the position vector or line joining sun and the planet okay so let's call it r r at time t okay now let's suppose in some time let's consider very small time okay so it moves from here to here moves from here to here right so how much is its displacement its displacement would be this much okay let's call this displacement delta s so this is r at time t plus delta t so it moves through some angle let's call it delta theta so can you see this it moves through some angle let's call it delta theta right so now when this planet is moving at each and every point its position vector and its velocity they will be perpendicular to each other they will be perpendicular to each other right okay so now if i want to find out area of this triangle okay actually area swept by it it will be area of this sector but you can say that it is almost equal to area of this triangle it's almost equal to area of this triangle right and how much is area of this triangle so let's call this area as delta a area swept by this planet is delta a in some time delta t so it is equal to what half of base multiplied by height so it is equal to half of r at time t multiplied by height is delta s okay height is delta s right okay so then now i will divide both sides by delta t what is delta t delta t is time taken by this planet to move from here to here okay right so then see what is delta s by delta t so this is displacement divided by time it is the velocity right if we consider very small interval to, uh, interval of time then it will be small displacement so small displacement divided by time it will be its velocity okay so this is equal to you can say half of r at some time t multiplied by its velocity okay so on left hand side you have delta a divided by delta t on right hand side what do you have you have half of r at time t multiplied by velocity now what i will do is i will multiply and divide this term by mass of the planet okay so let's suppose m is mass of the planet okay so what do i get so it is in numerator what do i have r at time t multiplied by v multiplied by m divided by in denominator i have 2m 
So what is the term in the numerator? Anybody? What is this term in the numerator? It is angular momentum. Right? Remember angular momentum L bar is equal to R bar cross P bar moment of linear momentum. Right? What is P? It is mass into velocity. So it is R bar cross mv bar. Okay? And if we consider momentary uh, variation in the path. Okay? If we consider very small time interval, then R bar and V bar, they will be perpendicular to each other. Okay? If planet is moving in an ellipse also, in circle, in ellipse, okay? R bar and V bar, it will be perpendicular to each other. Right? So, it is R multiplied by MV multiplied by sine of theta and theta is 90 degrees. Sine 90 is 1. Okay? So, if you take magnitude of this angular momentum, for the planet, it will be equal to mvr. So, what is this term in the numerator? It is angular momentum of the planet. Okay. So, now the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. Right. So, if you take another delta t, if you take another delta t, then the planet moves from here to here, suppose, here. Then this area will be equal to this area, delta A. So, delta A upon delta T is constant. Right? Delta A upon delta T is constant. Therefore, it sweeps out equal areas in equal intervals of time. Okay? Area is proportional to time. That means, area upon time is constant. Okay? So, if it is constant, that means, what is constant here? The angular momentum is constant. Okay. So, this second law, Kepler's second law, law of areas, it is actually consequence of the law of conservation of angular momentum. It is consequence for conservation of angular momentum. Okay. So, delta A by delta T is constant means L is conserved. Angular momentum is conserved. You got this? Yes, no? <laughs> Sorry. Or is there any question, any doubt in this? Yeah, good. So now, question is why is the angular momentum conserved? So question is why is the angular momentum conserved? Torque is zero. And why is torque zero? Torque is zero because force is radial. Okay, force is radial. See, if you take this planet, which is here, there will be some gravitational force acting on the planet due to sun. And what will be direction of that force? It will be along this radius. It will be along this radius. Right? So, what is the angle between radius and the torque or you can say position vector of planet with respect to sun and the torque? So, Sorry, what is the angle between the radius vector or position vector of planet and the force? So, because force is radial, because force is radial, so angle between R bar and F bar is 90 degrees. And what is torque? So, torque is R bar cross F bar. So, it is R into F multiplied by sin theta. This is the this is the magnitude of torque and theta is 90 degrees, theta is 90 degrees, so it is R into F multiplied by sine of, sorry, theta is how much? Zero. Right, theta is zero, so it is sine zero and that's why it's equal to zero. Okay. See, position vector of the planet and 
the force actually it's 180 degrees right it's not zero okay so torque is r bar cross f bar magnitude of torque is r multiplied by f multiplied by sin of theta and r bar is in this direction okay f bar the force due to sun on the planet it is attractive force it is along the radius but it's towards the center so r bar and f bar are at 180 degrees so it is r into f multiplied by sin of 180 degrees so this is equal to zero that's why torque is zero since force is radial since force is radial okay so here we understand one more thing if there is radial force acting on any object or any particle it will not change its angular momentum okay so angular momentum is conserved is conserved under the action of radial forces okay is it clear okay good spring so newton's sorry not newton's kepler's second law of planetary motion it is consequence of a consequence of conservation of angular momentum okay it is result of conservation of angular momentum why is the aerial velocity constant aerial velocity means change in area with respect to time so why is rate of change of area constant it is because angular momentum is conserved okay so this has been the question in some exams okay so don't remember whether it is neat okay but this question was asked in some exams all right let's see third law and third law is law of time periods or simply periods we can say square of time period not time period square of time period of planets orbit around sun is directly proportional to cube of any major axis okay so law of periods is square of time period of planets orbit around the sun it is directly proportional to the cube of semi major axis and what is semi major axis what is significance of semi major axis it is the average radius of the planet around sun okay it is average radius of planets orbit around the sun okay so how much is average radius it is equal to half of this major axis okay so so law of period says t square is directly proportional to r cube okay t square is equal to some constant times r cube we can say and what is r it is half of the major axis okay this is kepler's third law and we'll see that newton's law of gravitation proves this okay so is it clear law is clear okay so then let's come to the newton's law newton's universal law of gravity so what is newton's 
यूनिवर्सल लॉ ऑफ ग्रेविटी सो एवरी बॉडी ऑफ द यूनिवर्स अट्रैक्ट एवरी अदर बॉडी ऑफ द यूनिवर्स विथ अ फोर्स विच इज डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू द प्रोडक्ट ऑफ मासिस ऑफ द टू बॉडीज एंड इट्स इनवर्सली प्रोपोर्शनल टू स्क्वेर ऑफ डिस्टेंस बिटवीन दैम राइट सो इफ वी कंसिडर एनी टू मासिस एनी टू बॉडीज हैविंग मासिस एम वन एंड एम टू ओके इट कैन बी एनी थिंग सो देर इज सम ग्रेविटेशनल फोर्स एक्टिंग बिटवीन दीज टू मासिस दैट फोर्स इज डायरेक्टली प्रोपोर्शनल टू प्रोडक्ट ऑफ द मासिस एम वन एम टू एंड इट इज इनवर्सली प्रोपोर्शनल टू द स्क्वेर ऑफ डिस्टेंस बिटवीन दैम एंड इफ वी कंबाइन दीज वॉट डू वी गेट एफ इज प्रोपोर्शनल टू एम वन एम टू डिवाइडेड बाय आर स्क्वेर सो एफ इज इक्वल टू द ग्रेविटेशनल फोर्स ऑफ अट्रैक्शन इज इक्वल टू सम कॉन्स्टेंट ओके एंड इट्स नॉट सम कॉन्स्टेंट इट इज वेल डिफाइंड कॉन्स्टेंट जी ओके सो जी मल्टीप्लाइड बाय एम वन एम टू ओवर आर स्क्वायर एंड वॉट इज जी जी इज दूनिवर्सल ग्रेविटेशनल कॉन्स्टेंट यूनिवर्सल ग्रेविटेशनल constant okay so this is quite remarkable the same theory tells us uh, the gravitational force of attraction between earth and any object which is thrown in air okay so there will be gravitational force of attraction between them so that's why that object falls on earth same theory okay is applicable to the moon revolving around earth right same theory will explain moon's motion around earth same theory explains earth and moon's motion around sun and same thing explains sun's motion around the center of our galaxy okay which is the milky way galaxy right so it is also elliptical motion okay so it is applicable everywhere in the universe and the constant is also same right same is the constant gravitational constant of uh, for attraction between earth and a stone same is for earth and moon and same is for earth and sun and anything in the universe okay sun and any other star we can say okay so this is very very remarkable right so is there any question in this law so how do we write it in vector form let's suppose i want to write this law in vector form so let's suppose okay let's suppose this is m1 this is m2 and we have some coordinate system we have this coordinate system okay so there will be some position vector for m1 some position vector for m2 let's call them r1 and r2 so this is r1 bar this is r2 bar and the vector joining these two okay vector directed from m1 to m2 so suppose r12 r12 bar okay then now the force of attraction gravitational force of attraction due to m1 on m2 okay so force on m2 force on m2 which force gravitational force so suppose it is f21 force on 2 due to 1 f21 bar so its magnitude is g multiplied by m1 m2 over r12 square because distance is r12 and in what direction will it be directed it is directed opposite to r12 bar so if it was directed in uh, in the direction of r12 bar then this mass will be pushed away right it is in direction of opposite to r12 bar so to show the direction we put this negative sign so negative of r12 cap unit vector 
okay this is force on m2 due to m1 right so negative sign indicates that this is an attractive force clear so let us see some examples based upon this and the examples are very simple first one the kinetic energies of a planet in elliptical orbit around sun at positions a b and c are k kb and kc respectively ac is the major axis sb is perpendicular to ac sb is perpendicular to ac at the position of sun as shown in the figure then these are the options okay k is less than kb is less than kc then k is greater than kb is greater than kc kb is less than k is less than kc and kb is less than uh, greater than k is greater than kc which one will be correct so see we have seen angular momentum is constant okay so mass of planet multiplied by v multiplied by r is constant so considering mass is already a constant we can say the product of v and r is constant so if v is more sorry if r is more v will be less if r is less v will be more so closer is the planet to the sun higher will be its velocity and therefore higher will be its kinetic energy okay so indira is saying option 2 option b so k is greater than kb is greater than kc right exactly so since it is closest at position a its velocity will be highest at position a okay and it will be lesser at b and even lesser at position c so this is correct very good let's see this question planet moving along an elliptical orbit is closest to sun at distance r1 and farthest away at distance r2 if v1 and v2 are the linear velocities at these points respectively then the ratio of v1 by v2 is so we have just seen that v times r is a constant okay so we can say v is equal to what some constant divided by r so v is inversely proportional to r and therefore v1 by v2 will be equal to what r2 by r1 right since it is inverse proportion v1 by v2 will be equal to r2 divided by r1 okay next question the figure shows elliptical orbit of a planet m about the sun the shaded area scd so s c d is twice the shaded area s a b so this area is twice compared to this area okay twice of this area t1 is the time for the planet to move from c to d t1 is the time to move from here to here and t2 is the time to move from a to b a to b then very simple area is double that means time will be double okay because area so because the line joining sun to the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal area, equal intervals of time so if area is double time would be double right so option b is the answer okay Right. So this was very simple. Next one, the period of revolution of planet A around Sun is eight times that of B. The distance of A from the Sun is how many times greater than B, that of B from the Sun? So we know t square is proportional to r cube, right? T square is directly proportional to average distance cube. So we can say T one by T two square 
is equal to R1 by R2, R1 divided by R2 cube. Okay, and it's given that T1 is eight times that of T2. Period of revolution on of planet A is eight times that of B. Okay, so this is eight times T2 upon T2 square. So T2 and T2 gets cancelled. So it is 64. Okay, so this will be equal to 64, and it is R1 upon R2 raised to 3. So we know that 64 is 4 cube, right? 4 times 4 times 4. Okay, so we have R1 upon R2 raised to 3 is equal to 4 raised to 3. Okay, so this is equal to what? 4 raised to 3. Okay, so therefore R1 upon R2 is equal to 4. So R1 is 4 times more. Option A. Okay. There have been lot questions based upon Kepler's laws, which are very easy. Okay. The distance of two planets from sun are ten raised to thirteen meters and ten raised to twelve meters respectively. The ratio of time periods of planets is again this is very simple. So T one divided by T two raised to two is equal to R one divided by R R2 raised to 3. Okay, so this is 10 raised to 13 upon 10 raised to 12. R1 is 10 raised to 13 and R2 is 10 raised to 12 raised to 3. So 10 cube, or we can say it is 1000. Okay, so T1 upon T2 is equal to square is equal to 1000. So T1 upon T2 Equals to what? Square root of thousand, and thousand can be written as hundred times ten. So square root of hundred is ten. So this is equal to ten root ten. Okay, option B. Right? So again, this is similar question. Next question: The planet is moving in an elliptical orbit around Sun. If T, V, E, and L stands stand respectively for its kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, total energy, and magnitude of angular momentum about the center of the force, about the center of force, which of the following is correct? T is conserved. That means total energy is conserved. Okay, no, T is not total energy; it's kinetic energy. V is always positive, E is always negative, and L is conserved, but direction of vector L changes continuously. So we haven't studied about other things, but we know that L is conserved, right? So we'll study about other things. That means kinetic energy, potential energy, etc., etc. But we already know. That angular momentum is conserved, right? So option D is the answer. Okay. Next question. Two, <coughs> sorry, two astronauts are floating in gravitational free space. After having lost contact with their spaceship, so there are two astronauts. They are floating in gravitation-free space. So the two will move towards each other, move away from each other, will become stationary, keep floating at the same distance between them. So what is true? Yes. Option A. Move towards each other. Right. So space is gravitation free means they are far away from any other mass in the universe. But 
they have their own masses right and because of their own masses they will get attracted towards each other so option a is correct good indira okay the next question two spheres of masses small m and capital m are situated in air and the gravitational force between them is f the space around the masses is now filled with liquid of specific gravity 3 the gravitational force will now be so what will happen okay two spheres of masses m and capital m are situated in air and gravitational force between them is f the space around them is now filled with the liquid of specific gravity 3 okay so the gravitational force will now be yes option b okay why is it so gravitational force does not depend on the medium okay it is independent of medium right next question if gravitational force between two objects were proportional to 1 divided by r and not as 1 upon r square where r is the distance between them then the particle in circular path under such a force would have its orbital speed v proportional to okay so now let's suppose earth moves around sun in circular orbit so it's the gravitational force due to sun which provides for the centripetal force right so this is sun it's the gravitational force which provides for the centripetal force and therefore we can say fcp is equal to gravitational force and now what they are saying is suppose the force gravitational force was inversely proportional to r okay and not to r square then the speed is proportional to what okay so let's suppose gravitational force is some constant divided by r okay so now what is fcp it is mv square upon r so mv square upon r is some constant divided by r because gravitational force it's given that it is inversely proportional to r only so this r and r will get cancelled mass of the planet is a constant so v square is equal to the c divided by m so this is another constant right so therefore v is constant or we can say yeah it is independent of r option b is the answer let us see next question the earth mass is 6 multiplied by 10 raised to 24 kg revolves around the sun with an angular velocity 2 multiplied by 10 raised to minus 7 radians per second in circular orbit of radius 1.5 multiplied by 10 raised to 8 kilometers the force exerted by sun on the earth in newton is so what is given mass is given angular velocity is given and radius is given so gravitational force provides for the centripetal force so we have this formula for centripetal force f is equal to mr omega square right it is mv square upon r okay or we can say it is mr omega square another formula for centripetal force so let's substitute values so values are 6 multiplied by 10 raised to 24 multiplied by r is 2 multiplied by 10 raised to minus 7 no it's not r this is 
angular velocity. R is 1.5 multiplied by 10 raised to 8 kilometers. So we have to convert it into meters. So 10 raised to 8 multiplied by 10 raised to 3. 10 raised to 11 will come. Okay. Multiplied by 2 into 10 raised to minus 7. And we have square of that. Okay. So what do we get? So it is 6 times 1.5 multiplied by 4 multiplied by 10 raised to how much 24 plus 11 24 plus 11 is 35 minus 14 okay minus 7 raised to 2 okay so it is 1.5 multiplied by 4 is 6 6 uh, 6 times 6 is 36 36 multiplied by 10 raised to 21 would be the answer option a Right?